Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Triversity Talk. I am Stephen Bloomer Teague. And I am Wendy Stewart Kaplan, and we are happy to have you here tonight. Listen, I'm happy to have Stephen here tonight. In case you didn't notice, we weren't on last week because Stephen was on vacay in Fire Island. And doesn't he look all perky? I was about to say, I look a little browner than I did the last time you saw me. You're looking uh, very healthy and rested and tan. Well, it was all well and good, but you know, I got this haircut, which I absolutely love and didn't think about the fact that I had no hair when I was in the scorching sun. So for oh, the first no. couple of days, my scalp was on fire. But after that, it was all glorious. Well, and you, it was even glorious then. You you look great and no one can tell. Let me just have a little look-see up there. Nope, it's fine. It's not even flaking. You're good. I know. <laughs> Thank you, head and shoulders. Um, <laughs> So everybody, before we get started and introduce our wonderful guest, um, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, welcome. Um, if you are on YouTube, if you haven't subscribed to our page, please do that and smash, smash, smash that like button. Um, the more likes we get, the more likely people will see this. Um, so we appreciate it. We appreciate you and come with your questions. Yes. I mean, this is interactive. We see yeah. your questions as they appear. So if you have questions, shoot them our way Absolutely. and we will get to them either during the interview or after the interview, whenever we can space them in. Mm -hmm. And so. it, not just Stephen and I, Francisco, who's our guest tonight, will, she's so great at answering questions. Oh yes. And she loves to be asked questions, believe me, she loves to talk. So please get ready. And our guest tonight, Francisco is, there's so many things I can say about her. She is transgendered filmmaker, actor, writer, speaker, parent, um, spiritual beyond belief, probably one of the biggest hearts of anyone I've, I've ever met. Uh, she writes songs. She's a radio host. She's got, I thought I had a lot of shows out there. She's got more shows out there than, <laughs> than me. It's true. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on this amazing person, Francisco, please welcome her. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Stuart. Hey, Hi, darling. Stuart. Well, before, glad to be oh, here. oh, well, it's great to have you. Um, before we get started, um, I would love for you to show off your fabulous dress. Um, I would love that, to. I love this on Friday night. So here I've wore it uh, every other night so far. But that's it. Oh, it's, wow, you look adorable in it. And the colors are? These the are the trans colors. The yeah, they are. Colors, you know, yeah. soft pink, baby blue, and white. And I even have the- You have the bracelets. Bracelets. Very cool. I, Very have cool. Other, I have this other dress in my closet that I bought about eight years ago. It also has the trans colors and these little diamonds. And it's like my good luck, you know, I like basketball right. stars have the, the right jersey or whatever. Yeah. This is like my, was always my good luck dress. And now this is gonna be my good luck dress. The trans, trans is a good luck token. I love it. Well, we feel very lucky um, to have you here with us tonight. So, you know, I, I know you, I met you at the Golden Door Film Festival, actually. I didn't know you before then. What so impressed me about Fran there, she not only had an entire entourage with her, Fran carries a camera <laughs> with her with a, with a selfie stick on it. And whoever else has a camera, there's cameras where you see Francisco, you see cameras, right? But the thing that really impressed me the most was an adorable daughter of yours, Kelly, yelling, dad over here, dad over there, dad, 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 dad. And I'm like, who is this person? Right. So I'm going to open with a big question. Yes. Who is Francisco? Who is Francisco? Uh, well, in this part of my life, I'm uh, mostly an entertainer and a writer and trying to put into the world many of the things that I've worked on over the years and don't and didn't have out there yet. So I'm a, I'm a person who's really about to happen with even three or four times more stuff than I've already been doing. Over wow. <laughs> wow. So that's, 
you know, and I sense it. And I'm not just saying it just to say it. You know, I really feel uh, someone asked me, how does creativity like come to you? How does it happen? Why is why are you involved in so many different things? Because it looks like it probably looks like I'm scattered. Maybe I am scattered, but it looks like I probably can't handle it. But I think I can. I think I get involved in a lot of different things and complete most of them. But some of the ones that I haven't completed for many, many years, I'm about to complete now. One is a book that I've written called Left Brain, Right Brain, and the Soul. It's 1,300 pages. I finished oh, wow. writing yeah. it about, about seven years ago. And a few things happened in my personal life. I had to put, it, put that on hold. But I'm very close to coming out with that. And actually... I think it was the silver lining that I didn't come out with it because in the last seven years, I learned so much about myself, about other people, about this whole issue of left brain, right brain. You know, the left brain is the analytical side of us, basically, and the right brain is our creative side. But the right brain is also more our sensitive side and our um, relationship oriented side sometimes not apparently logical and just like the two of you are very right brained you know oh, on, how are you going to label oh. us as right brain right. you, you don't know me as well as you think uh -huh. i am <laughs> no, you're totally anyway, right. uh, so to answer your question who am i yes uh, i like to think that um almost always in transition as soon as i seem it's to either master or get a handle on a certain craft or skill i search for another a new one and, and part of that i think may be from being uh, add attention deficit disorder when i was young but i never considered it a disorder i considered it curiosity you know or uh an advantage actually being I completely world. agree with you on that. You know, harnessed correctly, ADD. You know, they started labeling kids with this now, but certainly when I was growing up, a lot of those kids went on to be brilliant, creative people. Yeah, so yes, you correctly, right? Yeah, like people like Thomas Edison. You know, Thomas Edison, oh. and uh, they say Da Vinci was. If there was a label back then, he would have been considered ADD and stuff. You know, he was involved in a lot of different things. So. So I'm, uh, I ain't done yet, put it that way, you know? Like I know, to me, I mean, and I'm sure Stephen agrees, Fran's just getting started. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of pots on the fire. So it, what was very interesting to me, um, when you and I, we've chatted on the phone, you told me a story, I said, like, how did, what made you know it was the right time to transition? Well, what had been happening was I've been cross-dressing since I was 10 years old, but I had to choose my left brain, my analytical side basically said, you got to really go with being a guy, you know, people know you as a boy, you seem to be going through life okay as a boy, but the older I get, the more and more I wanted to be female. In fact, when I was young, I used to go to bed at night and pray that I would wake up in the morning and be a female. So I had that like, always going that constant thing going on in my head so what happened was that i ended up you know year would go after year and i was you know i got married i met my wonderful wife you know i was head over heels for her we got married we were married a long time we're still married although we don't live together we still are soulmates although we're not man and wife and stuff i would like to have it uh, that way where we could live together, but she's not, you know, she doesn't want that, you know? So, um, and then we have a wonderful daughter who is 36, my daughter, Kelly, who you mentioned earlier. So, you know, I lived a life, uh, Price Waterhouse, you know, uh, CPA, career, travel, house, you know, all of that, friends, mm -hmm. all of that stuff as a male, but but in the background, I always wanted to be female. And then for some years, that became more and more compelling. So what I would do is I would cross-dress 
and I would go out party on the weekend because lo and behold, I found that there were thousands of people like me, you know, and I'm not saying say drag queens in the uh, gay community, although I definitely respect them. I was really heterosexual. So I, I didn't have uh, an affinity to gay, even though my brother, my younger brother was gay. So I didn't really have that many friends in that community, but I did have, it got a lot of friends, people just like me, you know, seemingly in the in this cross dressing community. So I would go out to conventions where there might be six or seven hundred of us. And then we would go to uh, New York City had a number of places. In fact, I stumbled on somebody in a phone call just last week and She's a, a, a lesbian. She's a gay woman who wants to open up an LGBT center in a building that she owns in New Rochelle. She happened by me. We contact, we spoke to each other. And then, uh, gee, I hope she may come on to this call tonight, perhaps. And then we started, I sensed that she was about my age. I, I, we started sharing wh where did she used to hang around, you know, in the city. And it turns out she said, crazy manny's and i it didn't click with me and i says was well, that near the now bar and she says oh it was across the street from the now bar on seventh avenue down below christopher you know and then i said you mean nannies she says yeah nannies that's what i said nannies and it w i went back in time and this is just a few days ago i had this conversation with her wow. i went back to being about 30 years old going to Manny's, Nanny's rather, before I would go to the now bar was a cross-dressing bar filled with men, boys, whatever, males like me and a few females. And I would go across the street to the lesbian bar thinking that perhaps I, I could find a girl that would be interested because I was still attracted to women. And I said to her, is the, is the, was the mirror there when you were there up on the second floor was this big huge mirror that i used to stand in front of and dance to the music and really get into it yeah. Yeah. I can see it. I can see it. and when she brought this up and then i said to her, you know by the way i took loads of video all throughout my life i've been taking video i have thousands of hours of video of the new york city scene back in the you know, 70s and 80s and stuff. Oh and someday I'm going to pull out and, uh, you know, do something with it. But anyway, to get, to get back to it is I've been living, I was living this crazy life all along. I'd be a, a, a male during the day. And then over time, I met more and more people as a female. They knew me as Fran. They never met Frank, you know, my male side. And so I had these co different communities. And then sure enough, and as a CPA, I would get clients, you know, who would know me, know the Fran part. So sometimes during the day, especially when I moved my office into my home about 20 years ago, I would in the day, in the morning, I would have a meeting with a client who knew me as Frank. And then two hours later with a client that knew me as Fran, I would go up to my bedroom. I would change, you know, make up. You know, uh, and at that time I was using more wigs. Now I use my own hair, you know, it's longer now. But um, so I was going about my life and I, I pretty much gave it up that I would ever become able to live full time as a female. And because I believed in an afterlife, I said to myself and to God, it's OK, I'll be a female in heaven, in my afterlife, or in reincarnation, or whatever. And then it, it, well, it didn't really sit with me, you know? And sometimes, and this might happen with many other people who aren't living their true self, you start taking additional risks. Maybe you drink a little bit too much, you stay out a little bit too late, you doze at the wheel sometimes, dangerously, 
Uh, you make some friends with some people you shouldn't really be making friends with. And I was starting to take some of those risks because underneath, I wasn't really happy. Being, I felt it was dishonest to live in the way I was living. Because if I was, if you knew me only as a guy, and if I didn't tell you that other side of me, I felt I wasn't living wow. genuinely. Wow. And also when I was dealing with a person who knew me as a female, and I didn't tell him about the other side, I felt I was being dishonest. And my father, from when I was very, very young, impressed upon me that honesty is really the most important, the baby beside health, but honesty is really the most important thing. If you don't have honesty, you got nothing, basically. And so that was a big influence on me. And then finally, it built up over time. I had a, a client came in, this uh, female, her name is Terry, she's a couple of years older than me. She sensed something was wrong, going wrong, because usually I was pretty up, no matter how I really felt. I always was upbeat and you know positive, basically tried to be. And, and right then I shared with her and she had no clue, you know, that I ever, cause I looked, you know, like a guy and my voice was very, you know, I didn't have any effeminate gestures and stuff like that. She did, she didn't have a clue and she was shocked and she said, well, wait a minute now, you might be happier living as a female. Did you ever consider that? And, you know, and I told, I gave it a whole story. Then. Then two days later, I I uh, got a phone call from a client of mine, different client, an older client, much older, and she called me up on the phone, and I was at home cross-dressed because it was like sort of, I took a day off, <laughs> my wife and daughter weren't around, and I needed, it was almost, it became like a drug almost to get through it. You know, I felt like when I, cross-dressed, things got easier, you know, life became more meaningful, you know, and um, in fact, in a song I wrote called I Want to Be a Cute Girl, there's a couple of lines that, that say this, they say, like this, you know, it's in a, it's in a song, you know, song in a song, but basically the words are, like this, people like me, like this, I'm a star, like this, life is magic. Like this, I love who you are. Like this, all I eat has a much better taste. Like this, uh, you know, all of all of the like this, like a female. And now I'm living that life, you know. So anyway, so my client calls me up. I was at home cross-dressed. I answered the phone. Hello. And she said, Frank, is that you? Because I, I was with a male, a female voice. And I said, and then in like a burst of honesty, I said to her, Doreen, she's since passed away. Doreen, it's me. This is me. I'm sitting here in high heels, stockings, a dress, and a blonde wig talking to you on the phone. And there was this big pause on the other end. And I thought, well, there goes that client, you know. She's going to give up on me thinking I'm crazy or whatever. And then sure enough, she, she got back on the phone and she said, can you come over here right now? I said, no, I can't. I'm in the middle of stuff. Come over tomorrow. I went over the next day. As I walked in, she had the kitchen door open. She was in the other end of the kitchen, about 15 feet away. I walk in the door because she called. Because uh, she, she asked, what did I like to be called, referred to in the phone the day before? I said, Fran. So when I arrived, she had the door slightly open and she heard me on the porch and she said, Fran, is that you? I said, yeah, Doreen. She says, come on in. I walked in the door. I had, I had on this black and white polka dot dress. I looked pretty sharp, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you in a polka dot dress. <laughs> this, this, about, this about maybe 15 years ago. So no, about maybe 12 years ago. And I walk in and she said, this is you. This is you. Like that. Like, it's like no question about it. This is you. And she knew me as Frank and she liked me as Frank. I helped her. When her husband died, 
a few years before, I helped her out a lot with her financial affairs and putting her in order and everything. So we got very friendly and close. In fact, at one point, my mother worked for me in my office when I didn't have it in the home. And she met my mom and they became like friends and stuff. So she says to me, what are you doing? Why don't you live like that? So she's the second person in like two days. So I said, how can I? I can't, I can't just, you know, I got all these clients. I have my mother, my father, my daughter, my wife, my friends, my all. My, my life, life. My, my life. life. That I built. She said, they'll all accept you because this is who you are. They'll this all accept you. Mm -hmm. And then she said, right now, in fact, this is, I've written a, uh, written my story as a play, a full play. And I've acted out many, about 25 scenes, you know, and I filmed them and it's pretty much ready to go. And I finished that book and it's currently being edited and reviewed by a couple of people. And one of the scenes is this scene. And Doreen says, you got to tell your mother. I said, I, I, my mom saw me. 25 years ago on a Halloween dressed like that. And she knew because I told her at 10 years old that I liked putting on a dress for Halloween. She won't have it. She said, you're a, you're a guy. You got to live as a guy, basically. And I don't want to upset her because at that time she had Parkinson's. My father had Alzheimer's. I didn't want, you know, no, let me not disturb anything. I never wanted really to focus on myself. I wanted to you know, really to take care of my family. So Doreen says, no, you have to tell her. She says, my son, Paul, his name, came out to her, which I didn't know until she told me, three years before that as gay at like 42 years old. She had a suspicion or whatever. He was single, you know, it's a, but she said, it made a huge difference as soon as he came out they both got closer and closer and she said you are missing an opportunity with your mother you got to tell her wow you you must tell her right. she gets the phone she had my mother's number i said no no and i'm holding it back she had my mother's number in her phone book because they had become friends she called her up on the phone and she says ellie my mother's name was eleanor but they used it. She used Ellie for people who were close to her. Ellie, I have your son here. Oh, and she must have said, oh, really? Oh, wow. Oh, good. She, you know, she knew I was her CPA and stuff. And she, Doreen says, but doesn't look like Frank, and not in a mean way or anything, and like trying to be helpful, and said, hold on, hold on. She wants to say something to you. Wow. Oh, and you must have been like, we're so oh, it's terrified a, at that moment. What a moment to be like yeah. raw and naked. Yeah. And to relive it in the scene. In fact, one of the people possibly calling in tonight is a person, her name is Lily, who acted as Doreen. I didn't even put the two of them, to, two of it together, but I just realized Lily with a, in an acting class with Vince Corotola about a year ago, acted as Doreen in the scene. She could like, you know, add more to this. And so I get on the phone with my mother and I said, mom, I, I came over here and, uh, you know, sort of like I'm trying to justify why I was being like that. And, and, and Doreen's going, tell her you're going to go over, tell her you're going to go over today and i said mom uh, i'm gonna come over the house this afternoon and doreen thinks it's a good idea and you know i'm like whatever 50 something years old you know but i'm really her son you know or her child of course mm -hmm. <laughs> and i uh, worry you know and she whatever she says is gonna work so she and she's saying no you can't come the aides are here, you know, the caregivers are here, the neighbors will see, bop, bop, all of the, all of the, yeah, the all like, the real stuff, right? All the real stuff. stuff that happens. And I'm saying, mom, 
maybe they're not gonna know. They won't even recognize me, you know, as a female and everything. Plus, I look so hot that day in that <laughs> black and white polka dot dress. So anyway, I couldn't convince my mother. That day, I went home. Okay, I was kind of blue. Doreen called me the next day. She said, you call your mother? I said, no, no, I'm going to let it go for a while. She said, no, call your mother. No, 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 call your mother. And I went on another phone. I called my mother. And I could tell, and I told at Doreen's funeral about two years ago, I told this story. This story. And about how it takes sometimes somebody that's not so tight with you in the family to coach you through something as I'm sure you guys in your lifetime and everyone gets influenced by sometimes it's a stranger on a bus. So then what happened? I was set up for it. I then uh, wanted to go see my mother. My mother knew I wanted to show her how I looked because I felt if I look, if she saw how I, that I looked not offensive and that I kind of looked like her, you know, that maybe she would see that it would be possible to live at least in a two state. And then what happened is then her caregiver, she agreed to let me go over. It was Halloween a few days later. I went over there as Halloween. I was dressed up pretty nicely. And she says, well, don't, no, don't come over until 630 after Jennifer, the, the aide. Uh, leaves. And so I went there. Uh, Jennifer was supposed to leave at six, six o'clock, six 15. I get there at six 30. Jennifer hadn't left yet because she was doing some last minute stuff for my father. Sure enough, she walks down the steps. It was about 10 steps down to the road. I'm sitting in my car. She looks. And I, at that time I, I had a blonde wig. I used to always wear blonde. Yeah, that's what I can't envision <laughs> in this entire story. Oh, but we know blonde. Oh, yeah. Oh, that makes I'm me gonna, feel happy. Yes. I'm going to hold up to the camera a photo <laughs> I saw Friday night. I showed somebody at a at a bar. Let's see, you want to see a it. show like 25 years ago, and I was a blonde, right, with a short skirt on. Anyway, so I get there. Jennifer is coming down the steps, and she looks in the car, and she says, Frank, is that you? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's for Halloween. You know, I'm trying to make an excuse or whatever. She said, no, nah, don't give me that. You look too good. She said, what's going on? She was on her way to walk to the bus. I said, get in, get in the car. I'll drive you to the bus. And we're driving and we're talking. We didn't really finish it up. We got to the bus. The bus was coming. I said, Jennifer, there's your bus. There's your bus. She says, let it go. Let it go. I want to talk to you. Uh, I says, okay. And she says, yeah, I want to find out why are you doing this? Why are we going back and forth? And then I said, well, I, you know, I have this whole life as a man. I can't leave that. And I can't, and who's going to accept my, but, you know, I'm giving all these excuses. They're kind of real reasons, you know, mm -hmm. she says to me, doesn't matter. Even your father. She said, we'll accept you. Not only your mother, but even your father will. As macho as your father is, he's going to accept you. You're his blood. You're his son. Blood, right? You know, he loves you. And your clients eventually will accept you and everything. So she's put the question to me like this. Tell me, what do you want to be, male or female? And in that moment, I made the decision and I said, female. And that's when I made the decision. And then I said, it's going to take me two months to put it into place. That was on October 31st. Two months later, on January 1st, it was January 1st, 2011. The, the new year. Cool. The new year. And the numbers were cool. One, 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 one. It was like propitious, you know. Mm -hmm. And... And that's what happened. So I spent those two months. I sent out letters to all my clients, my friends, my, and anyone who called me, I would say, oh, by the way, I'm going to transition to female. Please call me Fran for now on or Francis, you know, whichever is easier for you. 
and and I started my and I began a new life and and that and it has been an amazing life. Now, was that when your creative side kicked in post transition or was that side always there? I it was it was always there, but it was trying to be creative almost in the wrong places. Like for example, I would write great poetry, but I wouldn't be self-expressed enough to get up on a stage. I mean, don't get me. No, I, I did do spoken art, you know, spoken word and stuff like that. But I never really finished the songs and performed them as songs. I, I, I wrote things partially, but I never was fully me, you know, and I, because I always felt like, and even when I was a guy, what would happen is when I was a guy, I acted too macho. You know, I was always trying to prove myself as a man. Like if I played golf, I played it to excess. If I played pool, I, oh, I, I would be almost too competitive to the point of my, maybe even being annoying. You know, I would like to think I, I was a nice person and everything. But uh, so when, this happened when I was trans. All of a sudden, the world opened up. Uh, I read it. I read an ad for stand-up comedy classes in the city. Why not? It's a great thing to do. Just go for it. You felt like you could find a way for it, right? Yeah. It helped me to express myself. So I got up on the stage as a trans comedian, you know, and I got to tell about all the crazy things that were happening to me and, you know, all this back and forth kind of living and everything. And that greatly, greatly helped me. And then I took a lot of those poems and made them into songs and I started getting out and I started really performing a lot uh, more that way. And uh, my art, my art, I'm, uh, I'm an artist. And uh, for many, many years, I didn't, I didn't paint. And then I started painting again. Every, and, everything was bursting oh, out of you. It was real, really. So my recommendation, I'm not saying if you're a, a guy that's happy in your own life, to trans, transition to a female, or if you're a, a female who's happy to transition to a male. But I can tell you, changing your gender and is one of the biggest changes I think you can make in your life. Well, you also, I have you quoted as saying, and I was going to ask you about this. My transition was not only a change of gender, it was a change of spirit from left rein to right. Absolutely. Uh, for example, when I was uh, a cross dresser going to these conferences, I knew I had a, a pretty cool spirit. You know, I mean, I'm talking honestly here. I'm not sure. <laughs> you were cool. Yeah. But I, I had a, you know, I was very. Religious isn't the right word, but I had a close relationship with, in my case, it was with Christ. It could have been with any deity or whatever, or the universe. I, I was a fervent believer in the power of prayer. And so, and my spirituality was there's certain principles that you really should, you know, like the golden rule, you know, as an example and stuff, and Ten Commandments, you know, all the basic stuff like that. And I also believe very strongly that God, the universe, whatever you want to call that power, works more so instead of directly, you know, from here to here, from here to here, whatever, one-on-one, -on -one, works through people as the agents of God. And, there, and, and people are as almost as divine as God itself. And the more that you express yourself the more open people's energy and your energy can be to each other. Well, I'm thinking so, about what you said, the people that came into your life when you were starting to say, I'm, I'm going to live my truth. I'm thinking of the women that you just told us about that all of a sudden they uh, were there. All of a sudden, you know, what I was so worried about, I brought this up a couple of times about my clients, you know, I was, because I have a, I, at that time I had a, I have a, about a hundred clients now. I had then about a hundred clients. It's you know an active practice and stuff like that. You have close relationships with people. Now all of a sudden, and ninety eight out of a hundred of them 
not maybe not 98, maybe 80 out of 100 of them knew me as a male. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to show up as a female. You know, I was worried that they would think I lost it, you know, or something, right? Instead, what happened? It was like, uh, you remember Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, the movie, when he got the chance to go back into his life? Yes, yes. What people thought of him? I had that chance without dying. What happened is I got to those clients and I would meet with them face to face. I mean, I sent them a letter in the beginning or a phone call, but I would, you know, meet with them. And when I first walked in that door or met with them, within a matter of not even a minute, maybe 30 seconds, they comforted me and said, Frank, Fran, whatever, I just want you to know we love you. We want to deal with you. We love you. <laughs> it's it's what one fella, Joe, he was 89 at the time, Joe uh, Kramer, said, it's what's in here that counts. Not yes. what's on here. You know, I had a week at the time. And then <laughs> Gene, Gene Mafuji said, it's what's in here. She said a similar thing, but pointing to the breast. It's what's in here that counts. Not what's on here, because I had falsies at the time <laughs> but uh, you know now i'm on core hormones and i have real breasts and stuff but but um so the response was totally unexpected so that changed me so much that here i live my life with these preconceptions and that it wasn't worth anything the preconceptions it was all based on who I didn't know I was to these people. I didn't know how much they liked me and valued me. So what an amazing way I know, to, yeah. to find out. But it to also find out, you know, incredible amount of bravery on your part, Fran. I mean, yeah. you know, people say, you know, it's it's brave, especially in the first, maybe in the especially in the first uh, part. I like to tell this uh, little story about my daughter Kelly. The first night that she went out with me, I'm dressed up, right? So I had to go, I had a meeting the next day and I didn't have the right shoes. I mean, the shoes I had, they weren't the right shoes for the interview or whatever it was, a meeting with somebody, I forgot who. So I said, Kelly, go come with me to Marshall's. You know the shoe, you know the Of shoe. course. No, of course. <laughs> right. Marshall's, Marshall's shop. Come with Marshall's. It's like yeah. five minutes to 10. We drive, we speed down the Hutchison River Parkway down into the Bronx to Marshall's, jump out of the car. She runs ahead. She's getting to get into the store to tell them not to close it. I go in a few minutes after her, lock the car up, get into the store. She heads for the back of the store where the clearance section was. And we, before we went in, I'm, you know, I'm all dressed up as female, but you know, who knows how I really looked at the time. I mean, it was all put together. I mean, I had spent years cross-dressing, thinking I was doing a good job, but who knows how I really did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in there, Kelly's, and I said to Kelly, Kelly, whatever you do, please don't give it away, you know? Like, you know, that I'm a male and everything. I'm gonna try to really do this right. So we said, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and when she ran into the store, she gets in the back, she finds the shoes. She's so excited. And she yells out, Dad, Dad, Dad. <laughs> that is so Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and th there's three sales girls, right? So here's Kelly. And she's got this fiery red hair, right? And, she, and here she is, Dad, Dad. She's all excited. And it's because there's only a few minutes left till, till it closes, right? She knows I want. And the girls are looking around, the sales girls are looking around. They don't see any guy, you know, because I'm at near the front. They they thought I was a female. They look back at her. They thought that she was something was wrong with her. <laughs> that she's yelling out, Dad. <laughs> so finally they realize it's me. They come up, one of them comes all the way up to me. She says, What's the matter? Why are you so red in your face? Why are you? So oh, I'm embarrassed, you know, I was trying to pass as a female and as she yells out, dad, I'm embarrassed. And the woman, the sales girl says, don't be embarrassed, don't be embarrassed. 
here at Marshall's, everything is irregular. <laughs> <laughs> best, best commercial ever. Oh my God. I, 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 I think I should make that as a commercial. I should probably do that. So funny. And and there were th there were like moments like that over. And so the more I was doing comedy, the more I was out there, the more I was myself, the more I wanted to be even further out there. So I was doing, I, and I've still been, I'm painting, I'm writing, I'm uh, making sculptures, you know, big, huge sculptures and stuff. The art, uh, I know, tremendous amounts of, of art. You're, you're filmmaking, your film, Happy Trans Girl. Oh my God. Yeah, that was, that was it. It was such a joy. You can feel and that. When you, yeah. saw, you saw that because I presented that at Triversity. When yes, you did. You were so generous to give me like, I think it was like two or three hours that day of talking about myself. And as you can tell, I like to talk about myself. That's <laughs> why we love you. <laughs> and I came over there and we showed the film. And by the way, that film, 17 minute film, which is a compilation of clips from the Pride Parade. Yeah, there's a lot of pride in there. Going down Christopher Street, mm -hmm. standing on the float, the Episcopal Church float, and waving to people on uh, Christopher, thousands of people on Christopher Street. What a joyous time that was. And then mixing them in with some clips from comedy, some clips from some uh, panel discussions, and then the song. I was about to say, there's a certain yeah. song in there. Yeah, that's right. I, get it that, out of my head. I would wake up at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what, what happened with the way that song happened is I was trying, you know, going full time female, I was also trying to clear up a lot of baggage in my life. So I tend to hang on to things, you know, like collect things and even papers and records and not. not Music records. I mean, anyway. So I went. I got a dumpster, <laughs> like one of those thirty foot. Yeah, dumpsters. yeah, big dumpster. In my driveway, I hired like four guys. I put ads on Craigslist. I had these four unknown guys come over, and I threw out the equivalent. It filled up the dumpster. Filled it up. Thirty foot dumpster, five feet high, and about seven feet wide, of paper. It's and cathartic. You were letting go. You were letting go with that dumpster. I was letting go. And one guy at the reason I brought it up was about the song. One guy at the table, we were having lunch outside. I got lunch brought in, you know, from a whatever pizza shop or whatever for the workers. They were really nice guys. And we started talking about other things beside building the shed, uh, emptying the, you know, the stuff from the basement and stuff. So it says, oh, you like music? I said, yeah, I like music a lot. I'm, in fact, I'm working on a song that goes like this. Don't you want to be a cute, happy trans girl like me? Don't you want to be a... And I'm singing this. Because the guy says to me, sing it for me. There's a guy from Jamaica about maybe 29, 30 years old. Made did beats when he wasn't answering ads on Craigslist. List he would do beats for people, and he would make do for like a couple two thousand dollars or thousand dollars a beat. Two days later, he comes to me with the beat. Love it, love it. Great story. Oh, wow. Long, how it happened, and all of a sudden, I had the beat. I had the music. I went to. Other people I was working on already on a lot of my songs. I start, like I said, I was trying to complete things. Uh, I have about 30 songs, you know, pretty cool song. So and, do the chorus. Yeah, we want to hear the chorus. Or what I consider the chorus. Uh, on this song? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Friend. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, trans. Yes, friends. Yes, friends. Yes, <laughs> I swear to you, that's what woke me up at two in the morning. Oh my God, that, that song. And then what we did is, and everyone liked the idea, you know, that song was proclaiming that I, as a relatively happy trans girl, it's called Happy Trans Girl Like yeah, Me. Trans girl mm -hmm. like I me. felt it a duty, a responsibility to get out there because there's so many 
literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are still living, say, on this in that community, still living closeted. And you know, in, in from tri Triversity and all your good work in helping the LGBT community, that there are people who are living, sh you know, with their gayness as a, as a, or their non, you know, binary life, or whatever, as a secret. And there's no reason for it, you know. And so I felt that that song, if I can make a song, in fact, I wrote it for a 12-year-old trans girl who I met her and her mother uh, when I was doing Transgender Days of Remembrance events. So I do a lot of speaking, yeah. a lot of public speaking and stuff like that, advocacy. And I met them and I thought of, oh, how great. She's an adorable uh, pink hair, you know, pink and, and blonde hair, adorable girl. And she was, you know, pretty far along in her transition, you know, at least her mental transition. Physically, uh, she was on, a, you know, certain uh, puberty blockers and things like that. And there was some controversy about that. Mm -hmm. Actually, she's actually one of the most famous uh, trans girls in the world, actually, right now. She has some 5 million or 8 million views of one of oh, her wow. videos or whatever. Great, great so, story. this is before she got so famous. I approached her, I wanted her to sing the song, and I imagined like her being backed up by four other teenage trans girls and me and some older trans girls in the background <laughs> doing the la la la, you know, and everything. Yes, trans. And uh, we would have a hit music video out of it well it turns out she wanted to play soccer more than she wanted to do the the song or whatever. <laughs> so i got disappointed so i said i'm gonna do it myself so what i did is i took that song and no matter where i went i looked for an opportunity like through the imperial court of new york which is a great uh, yeah, it, it, LGBT great organization. Organization. you know we do performances uh, and it, the organization is really throughout the world, and I would encourage people to look that up, icny.org, or in, remember Imperial Court, you can go on Facebook. And we would do performances, and the performances would raise money, you know, raffles and entry fees and stuff, and that money we would give to beneficiaries who are often LGBT-oriented, like... Um, you know, uh, Trinity Place. You know, and um, in, and at Stonewall, we did a lot of these, a lot of these um, performances. Uh, we would give money to uh, God's Love We Deliver, who was often, you know, we we would, um, you know, another one uh, that really uh, I got close with was the Tyler Clementi Foundation. Yes. So uh, where Tyler Clementi was the young boy. Mm -hmm. committed suicide by jumping off the George Washington Bridge because he was outed by his roommate who had shown Well, we have in our story, the Alan Kaplan's film, Rainbow Ending. To, we oh. open up with a story that's about right. Tyler Clemente because that's a story that needs to be told again and again and again. Yes. Yeah, so in fact, I, I matched up uh, uh, Jane Clementi with a couple of uh, other people and stuff like that. So anyway, that organization, the Imperial Court, was very helpful to me too because it allowed me, now I'm a living, breathing trans person living full-time as a female. I can't not be part of the LGBT community of like I was before. I was not part of it. So now I went headlong into being part of it. And understanding and getting closer with gay men and gay women who I hadn't been. You know, I mean, I was friendly. I mean, I wasn't not friendly, but I, I wasn't, you know, as close with. And I got really close, partly because of this organization. And my suggestion for people, and we're talking about transition a little bit, is in life, especially when you get to your 50s and 60s and 70s, it's time, instead of thinking about retiring and things like that, think about changing and transitioning and doing stuff that you never did before or that you once wished that you could do 
I don't care what it is. Maybe it's detailing a, a, a car, you know, a 1956 Chevy. I don't care what it is. Or it's writing a doo-wop song or whatever it might be. Or it might be building a, a deck, you know, on the front uh, of the house. Whatever it was that always thrilled you or you dreamt about, do it. Start doing it. And the doing of it is not only in your own doing it, because then you get on the phone and you ask somebody, hey, did you ever build a deck? And then they give you some help. Before you know it, they're next to you, hammer, hammering away with you, and you develop the new friend. You, you know, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm really saying. But you are so, anyone listening, friend, you are just as a human being, and I have to tell you this: you are such an inspiration. Uh, I and I say this all the time about you and. All the people that we all, you're one of the people I feel so incredibly close to, and I completely trust. You are totally authentic as a human being. You say what you mean, you practice what you preach, and you came here tonight and you gave us such honesty and such incredible truths about yourself. And damn it, I love you to death, I have to tell you. And I want, if it's okay with you, We've got questions. Is it can yeah, we open yes, to the questions yes, now? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So great. First one. Um, I'm gonna post yeah. it. I have to put on my glasses to see. So it. Oh, this wow. is from um, Jennifer Ricci, um, and she says, "Fran, you never cease to amaze me. Do you think that when you were honest enough with yourself to live full time as a woman, that you were freer with your creativity? You have done so many projects." in every medium of the arts in the past years. It's truly amazing. Now, I think you've answered this question already, but I did just, if there's anything yeah. else you wanted to add to it. Um, uh, you know, Jennifer, I did, that's a, you know, an example. Jennifer, I met a few years ago because I, when I started acting uh, and took some classes in acting, especially I started with Vincent Pastor. And uh, I knew I needed to do more stage work. And so a good friend of mine, Anthony Valbiro, uh, who's a director and a actor and a performer, and I've seen him over the years, a phenomenal, phenomenal entertainer, was associated with the Harrison Players, of which Jennifer is the president. And they were putting on a musical, MAME. What a wonderful musical, filled with phenomenal music. Yeah, and uh, I auditioned for it, and I did a, a a song, and I guess I wowed them, and or I impressed them enough to to get into the audition. I had a, a, a speaking part, you know, and I was in the the ensemble, the dance ensemble, and you know, it was the leader of the well, anyway. And I met Jennifer through that. By the way, Jennifer recently was on one of my Zoom shows where I interviewed Valerie David, who has a phenomenal show called The Hulk, talking about how she got through having cancer. Oh, wow. wow. Pink, it's called the Pink, Hulk, Hulk. the Pink Hulk. And I invited Anthony and Jennifer to be part of that show. And, to, and so, and then I didn't really appreciate enough that Jennifer went through that, you know, a cancer, and she's cancer free now but how that affected her life. And so, and she's a tremendously creative person. So to have her say something like that really means a lot to me. And I find that because of being, in, for my, in my case, it was trans. For someone else, it might be something else where they let their guard down, they become more authentic. And I would encourage people to look into their hearts and find where you could be more authentic. And um, yeah, such such well spoken words. So another question, Fran, comes from Simone Krauss, and Simone asks, "How did the HRT make your brain feel?" And she says, "For me, it was like I was running on the right fuel for the first time in my life." Yeah, I th I I agree with Simone. Uh, it felt very natural. You know, I was expecting it to to not feel natural. All of a sudden, it felt like the HRT, the hormones, gave me permission to be mm -hmm. my sensitive self. Before, 
when I was in a movie and I started crying or I was at a concert and I started crying because of, um, I cry at beauty, you know, whatever form it takes. I tear up. I mean, I don't bawl or it. And then, but I would hold it, try to hold it back. It wasn't the male image that I had growing up, maybe as an Italian American or whatever it was. And now on the hormones, it sort of gave me that permission. So it, it was the juice. And then all of a sudden I got to be much more sensitive. And I think the sensitivity combined with the creative opportunities, sort of like, well, now that you transition to female, now you don't have a reason for not being successful or happy. You know, if you, if you get to that big plateau, you know, just like if, if uh, all of a sudden you came into some money, you know, and you always wanted to be uh, a big business person, you know, and be successful. And you came into some money. Well, now you better start some businesses and get successful. So that's the same way I felt with, with being female. And, uh, and also, physically, I can't explain it. You know, Stephen, you know, when you look in the mirror and you see your wonderful, beautiful, handsome self, that that's who you are. And when do you see, when you look in the mirror, your beautiful self and the both of you with your wonderful smiles, that that's who you are? No matter how good I looked, and I was told by many people I was a very good looking guy, whenever I looked in the mirror, it wasn't how, when I was younger, like 10 years old, I used to block the door, comb the, my hair down in bangs in front and go like this, like, you know, trying to be a, a, a girl. And so now the hormones just added to that. You know what I mean? Skin was smoother. The breasts were developing. It added to that self image, you know? So, so anyway, so I, I agree with uh, Simone and I love Simone meeting her and hearing her story uh, at Triversity. By, by the way, I'd like to recommend for anyone listening who is not familiar with Triversity, uh, it's not that long of a ride to, to move to Pennsylvania. It's well oh. worth the ride. One hour and 40 minutes from New York City. And if you see that you can do it in an hour and a half. Oh, I we, do not, <laughs> we don't encourage it's, uh, one it's hour, don't encourage speeding. One hour, 45 well. minutes. And meanwhile, and not everyone just stays in Pennsylvania. You know, they move around too. And look, with the magic of Zoom and StreamYard and all this other stuff, we have so many ways to connect with everyone. Is that yeah. uh, did anyone else answer ask any questions? Let's see. We probably have some comments on there too that are, are worth putting out there. Let's see. We have um oh somebody misses Lily Justina Nin says so happy. Well, hold on, where is that? Oh, so happy to know you, miss you in class. When are you returning to class? Does she mean acting class? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah. After Vince uh uh Vincent Pastor's class, uh, about a year and a half of classes with, with Vincent. And uh, I took the Vince Curatola's class because Vinny Pastor said I graduated. And then I took Vincent uh, Curatola's class for about a year. And then other classes too. I'm a member of the Brazen Giant Ensemble. Of course, yeah. Phenomenal group of actors, directors, and, producers, mm -hmm. and you know them and they know you. Yeah. And uh, we meet like every two weeks now. Mm -hmm meeting on zoom and stuff but we used to meet down on uh, mcdougall street and in fact they've done many scenes from my play they were very helpful for my play and development so i would get some acting training there and plus auditions and i've, I've been an actor in a couple of films uh two or three films actually and a play uh uh, beside Mame, recently a, a small part in a play called Used. It was a fabulous play. I played a cut sort of a mean landlord, you know. <laughs> I saw. Wait, I I saw something where you played a landlord. Yeah, I knocked on the door and I told yeah. him you had to pay me and stuff. A and, mean uh, landlord. Yeah. So hey, number, move out. Uh, so right now, to answer Lily, is I'm planning to go back, but I had told Vince Corotola that I have to start prioritizing. And what I was finding, 
I have a tendency to do that, take too many projects on and and not be able. So I'm completing my book and I'm launching my play or series or whatever it is. It's called Once a Boy. And I'm not going to take any more acting classes until I get that finished. So I'm hoping that's just months away, you know, not years away. Okay, now look, I, I love, Wendy can't quite go incognito when she's trying to look at questions because the glasses come on. <laughs> Wendy's mind isn't bad, it's no, it's no secret. Um, oh, beautiful glasses, by the way. So I'm gonna ask this one last question because Samantha, our producer, is already gonna want to strangle us. <laughs> um, but- uh, It's okay, we'll survive. Yeah, Sorry, we'll survive. Samantha. Sorry, Samantha, Sorry, we love you. Mind. Love you. Um, so another question from Simone, which is, have you lost family, relatives, or friends yeah. once you started living full time? You know, I'm so glad she asked the question, and I'm. Uh, That's a very relevant question. And I'm sad, and I won't take too long in the answer because I know you're short on time. Uh, the it it deepened. It actually deepened the relationship with my mother and my father. Wow. Yeah. Well, Actually, it deepened, partly because I, I got more active with them. They became sick, and I was there almost every day managing their care. But they got to see me in my more natural state as a female. Who you are. Who I am. And that was very important. I think with my daughter, Kelly, I think it, none, it didn't hurt. And I think she also got to see me more authentic. And uh, I think that was good. With my friends, I don't think anything has hurt. With the new people that know me as Fran, uh, they don't really know the difference. For my old friends, I went to my high school reunion, you know, as a female, and I was able to, and I have those friends. So, so the answer is the only one, and it's probably the most important one, and it's something for people that are considering transitioning to really think hard about. And it's the thing that kept me, the main thing that kept me from transitioning all those years is my relationship with my wife, Lori. And I love her so much. When we f we, were, we were married for over 40 years and wow. we shared so much together. And that is the, the hardest. And I live with that, you know, and that's a real hard thing. But it was almost as if, if I couldn't be myself, I wouldn't be even any good for her. Like, you know what I mean? I, it was starting. It, it, it wasn't authentic. It wasn't real. You know, it was, uh, so it's almost better that we're now soulmates with me being happier. Even yeah. though you may be less happy because I'm not there. I'm not, you know. Uh, we're not cohabitating and stuff, uh, but it would have been it would it would have been worse if I had not transitioned. I mean, I, I really, uh, I'm not, I wasn't suicidal, you know. Don't get me wrong, but it was. I I could see that I would have probably start taking huge risks and eventually undone myself and undone some people. Wow. So I would. Uh, you know, I have friends who cautioned me about it for many years, you know, not to transition because you're going to lose your wife, those friends that I was open and honest with. But now they they agree that it was probably the right thing for me to do. And, uh, and I know for myself. And also, I know that I, I had a close relationship with Christ throughout this entire period from when I was young. And I know that my own relationship with Christ was side by side. Mm -hmm. No way else would I have been able to accomplish what I've accomplished had it not been for the personal involvement of Christ and God, mm -hmm. I feel. So, uh, Friend, Thanks. such a powerful yeah, story. Really. <laughs> and I mean, and you know, I think, Triversity Talk is intended to be an educational program and just people hearing your story, mm -hmm. I am sure learned a lot or, and if they're viewing this later, will learn a lot. So we are very grateful 
to have you telling this story for us. Thank, thank you thank for you. being here. I, I want to also mention that if anyone listening has a child, they themselves, has a parent, has anyone that's going through difficulty, and many, many, many thousands, luckily people are more open and they are making more changes, you know. But if anyone wants to, a shoulder to, you know, to cry on or to talk to, I do that a lot, you know, with a lot of people. Or I could refer them to other people, maybe who are more expert than I. But I have a, quite a bit of life experience at it. And I offer my, my they could get in touch with me through my website. Yes. I could like to give that website is. Yes, of course. I will post. Steven's going to put it right up. Oh, great. Thank you. You're probably one of the most empathetic people I've ever met. And it's just in, it's just in you. Fran, you know? what is your website? Trans, G-R-A-N-S, Fran, F-R-A-N, mm -hmm. Cisco, S-I-S-C-O, transfrancisco.com. Sort of sounds like San France. It's like the song I remember, Trans Francisco, when I first met you, and that's how I remembered your website. Sure. Now, you talked about Fire Island. I remember it doing in the, uh, what's the ice rink over there called? Ice Palace. Palace. Ice Palace. Palace. Came I, back did, I did a couple of songs over there, you know, several years ago. And uh, 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 what's her name? Brenda Darling. And was there with another one, and that's how Trans Francisco, all oh, the San Francisco treat. You know? that's, so, that's so funny, Fran. Thank you so much. I want to. We want to thank our audience for tuning thank in. You. Absolutely. On, on Sunday night, thank you can be anywhere, but you are here with us, and and we love you for it. Absolutely, so we love you. We love you, Fran, mm -hmm. and thank you to everyone. And we look forward to seeing yeah. you next week. We'll announce our guests tomorrow in Triversity's newsletter. Great. Um, so make sure you go to our page yes. on Facebook. Exactly. Go to our Facebook page. If you're watching this on Facebook, you're pretty, you're doing pretty well for yourself in terms of finding our newsletter <laughs> um, because it's going to be at the same place um, tomorrow at some point. So, um, so again, friend, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so and we will see you next week. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.